chapter 12, and I'm also going to read from Matthew chapter 24. Killing two birds with one stone is a little bit of my approach. Uh, this morning I have two divergent, uh, though connected, subjects that I want to minister on tonight. That's not the norm. Usually you pick a subject and extrapolate on that. Uh, and stick to that, but I want to try to go in two directions, parallel tracks granted, but uh, in two uh, directions. I'm going to read Matthew 24 first, uh, and then I'm going to go to Luke chapter 12. In the early morning hours of Friday, just two days ago, at 2.30 in the morning, a 42-year-old 42, 42 man by the name of David DePage uh, with obvious, very serious mental disorders, mental issues, uh, broke into the home of Nancy and Paul Pelosi in San Francisco, California. Nancy was not in uh, the home at the time. Uh, this uh, individual, David DePage, attacked with a hammer Paul Pelosi, uh, causing serious injuries, although after surgery he's going to uh, survive and return to normal health. Uh, uh, Paul Pelosi is, of course, the husband of the Speaker of the House uh, of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, who is third in line uh, to be President of the United States. This individual walked up to the House, apparently no security to prevent him from doing that. Paul and Nancy feel safe with the cameras and the security that they have. He broke a back window, was not concerned about the noise he might make. Started walking through the house shouting, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Police arrived shortly thereafter during the attack uh, and were able to make the arrest and get Paul Pelosi medical care to the hospital. Paramedics arrived. That was quite a shocking piece of news, but is it just another crime? Read about crime every day in the newspapers. That's what fills the airwaves with CNN, NBC, Fox News, and you have a television, that's what you see every night on your nightly news. Is it just another crime, though a little bit unusual? They live in a $6 million mansion. You would think they would have a little bit better security. I suppose you could say that it's just another crime. Stuff happens. But it's my assertion this morning that there's something more than that going on in America today. We are living in an age of lawlessness. And I'm going to define what that means and you'll see what I mean by that. We're living in an age of lawlessness. You wouldn't think lawlessness would touch Paul Pelosi in a $6 million mansion with the assumed security, but it did. Lawlessness is reaching into every strata of society, uh, from the neighborhoods into the mansions of the United States of America, from high schools and college campuses uh, to our streets, uh, even in upper and higher end uh, neighborhoods. Sometime uh, in the last few years, the Miracle Mile in Chicago uh, was completely destroyed uh, through rioting. Stores closed down, some of them permanently, uh, as we're seeing what the Bible refers to as uh, the spirit of lawlessness beginning to take control of many of the institutions and in the population of our country. Jesus prophesied that this would occur as one of the aspects of things that would be happening in the last days. We talk about Israel and Russia and the alliance of nations and pandemics and all of these things were prophesied as signs that would indicate that Jesus Christ is coming soon. I haven't preached on this subject. I know Pastor Ernie has folded it into some of his teaching on prophecy, but I want to zero in on this along with another scripture uh, that I think lines up with it. And we're going to begin by reading Matthew chapter 24. You remember that's the chapter where the disciples came to Jesus uh, and they asked him, what are the signs going to be when you're going to come again? And he began to answer their question. And that's 
uh, primarily what Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are actually about. So let's begin reading them in Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 3. Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then skip to chapter, uh, and then skip to verse 11 rather. Verse 11. That's verse 12 you have up. Oh no, verse 11 is up there, okay. Verse 11 says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound. Not just uh, crime in general, that's always been the case, uh, but lawlessness uh, will abound. The love of many will grow cold because of that. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. I'll read the other text in a moment. Father, thank you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this moment of time that we can minister the gospel, preach hope and salvation to people that are desperate and lonely and lost in their lives, Lord. And I pray for special anointing on this message, Lord, that you would open the eyes of individuals, touch the hearts, shine the light, Lord, and cause people to turn from sin to the glorious revelation of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we give you praise and we give you glory for it in Jesus' name. So I want to talk with you about the age of lawlessness. There has always been lawlessness. We know that. We grew up with it. It's historical from the very beginning of time from when Cain murdered his brother Abel. There's been Crime and there's been lawlessness. The Ten Commandments, uh, six of them, uh, four of them deal with our relationship with God. Uh, six of them deal with relationships with each other. Uh, and many of those are crimes written uh, into our civil uh, laws. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That used to be against the law. Thou shalt not murder. That, of course, is against the law everywhere in the world. Lawlessness is simply defined as people who live outside the boundaries of law. Law is a restraint for most people. We don't do things that are illegal. I can't steal, I can't cheat, I can't hurt somebody, I can't speed 80 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour. And so law is a restraint. But there are individuals, there always have been individuals uh, that generally have been a minority, a small minority, uh, that have lived lawless lives. They don't recognize boundaries. They don't respect law. Law doesn't confine them. It doesn't restrain them. And it doesn't restrict them. When it comes to doing what you want, getting what you want in life, there are people who are lawless. And there may be some here this morning. When it comes to getting what you want, if you really want something, you would steal it. You're lawless. If you want to acquire money, you will cheat, you will steal, you will incorporate a lack of integrity, maybe in your work, in your business. You are lawless. You're not restrained or restricted by what is legal and what is bound by law. Acts of violence, people that perpetrate acts of violence uh, and hurt other individuals. They might beat them over the head with a beer bottle in a fight in a bar or break a pool cue over their head. Or they may assault someone. We've been reading uh, about all these assaults that are taking place uh, in many of our major cities, senseless, uh, where these guys play a game and they go up to a stranger. Uh, it could be an elderly person or a young man or a young, and they punch them and then they run just for fun. People have been shoved onto subway tracks in New York City. We read one uh, about one last week in the newspaper. Verse 12, Jesus warns, one of the signs that I'm coming soon is going to be lawlessness and it will abound. Not normal. 
It's going to spill over outside the boundaries of what society has always accepted as norms. There's always going to be a minority of people that are going to commit crimes. We build prisons that are so big to house them. We have courts. We have judges. We have police officers. But now lawlessness is abounding to a degree it can't be enforced. Laws can't be enforced any longer. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you. It's the condition, the word that Jesus used is the condition of living without law governing your life. It's transgression. Transgression is when you know there's a boundary, but you cross over it anyway. You see the speed limit sign. It says 60, but you go 85. You know what the boundary is. You know something is wrong. There's clear cut, but you don't care. You could care less what laws are there. You have no respect for law. You're not restrained or restricted or bound uh, uh, by any laws or some laws uh, and you will violate them without conscience or without impunity. Jesus is saying that lawlessness is going to become extreme. It's going to abound. That word abound means to be overflowing. And he said that's going to be the condition As the day of the Lord approaches, and he will even stretch beyond that. I'm not going to preach about the second coming this morning or the rapture of the church. However, I'll say this, that this lawlessness is going to continue and be exacerbated by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he takes us all away. Now, even though there is lawlessness and it's abounding, there are still police and courts and laws, etc. Well, that's going to be removed. As a matter of fact, the Antichrist is referred to as a man of lawlessness. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, in the Amplified Translation, it says, for the mystery of lawlessness, rebellion against divine authority and the coming of the lawless one is already at work, but it is restrained now, only until he who now restrains, meaning Christ, is taken and out of the way. His presence is going to leave. And then absolute abject lawlessness. And the Antichrist uh, again is referred to as a man of lawlessness. Uh, he's going to spit in the face of God and know what he's doing. He's going to view himself uh, as superior to God. And he's going to lead a worldwide rebellion not just against the laws of man, but against God himself. When the Lord appears in the battle of Armageddon, uh, the Bible says uh, that the armies on earth are going to turn and think that they can fight against uh, the Lord himself and his army. That's how far lawlessness is going to go uh, that we're beginning to see the beginnings of it right here and now. We now have restraints. As I said, we have policies, we have police, we have laws, we have courts, we have prisons, and they serve as restraint as best they can. But the restraints are already being diminished and they're already being minimized. In an article in, of all places, the Harvard Law Record, which is a very liberal-leaning oriented uh, publication, wrote an article uh, called The Land of Lawlessness, How Power in America Has Turned the Rule of Law into Mere Myth. And it goes on, lawlessness is an overwhelming fact of American life. Though little attention is paid to this, many unsplendored phenomena. How many times have we been told that our country is under the rule of law and nobody is above the law? Yet the country's legal life is defined instead by major zones of lawlessness created in one aspect by noncompliance and lack of enforcement. In another, by raw power, which can be political, economic, or armed. These multiplying zones have pushed the rule 
rule of law into little more than a torrent uh, of dysfunctional myths. Now, that's a little, uh, you know, a little wordy. Uh, but what he's saying is that lawlessness uh, has, has uh, stretched into every strata of society. Our institutional, our institutions uh, are now taking on a spirit of lawlessness. Uh, sometimes the courts uh, and, and the educational system, uh, there's a spirit of lawlessness at work uh, living outside the boundary of either man's law or God's law. Another article, The Death of Law and Order is Destroying America. And uh, the author writes, what other result could there be? And he's referring to all the rioting and crime and looting and burning down of businesses and uh, just general criminal behavior that is so extreme today. And he goes on and says, this permissiveness, in other words, many times police are just getting out of the way and they're letting it play out. And he says, this permissiveness begets more lawlessness as violence spreads and escalates, just like Jesus said, lawlessness is going to abound. Another article, the law, uh, new lawlessness, new lawlessness is gripping America. This disorder is everywhere. Innocent pedestrians on the streets of New York uh, and other cities get sucker punched by attackers uh, for no reason. Uh, carjackings by juveniles are skyrocketing in Washington, D.C., in Brooklyn. Uh, a man shot and killed a McDonald's worker after his mother complained about being served cold French fries. A visible marker of social disorder is the phenomena of mass shoplifting in pharmacies. Uh, and other retail stores, which is happening so often uh, that it has become normalized. Videos capture people filling huge bags with goods uh, and facing no, restrict, uh, no resistance uh, from staff as they stroll out the door. Uh, stolen, I stolen items are then resold on the streets, uh, on eBay, or in more sophisticated operations, uh, they're shipped overseas and relabeled. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid reported in September that it lost $5 million in stolen goods in the prior three months. Last year, Walgreens uh, was forced to close more than a dozen of its stores uh, in San Francisco due to shoplifting. And again, these are shoplifters that push their carts through the store, load it up, uh, and in California, uh, $950 or less of shoplifting is a misdemeanor, and po the police and courts aren't going to do anything about misdemeanors. they got too many felonies to deal with. So you can go into the store, get everything, no one's going to stop you. So let's look at what is currently going on. The areas where lawlessness, the lawlessness that Jesus is referring to is being expressed. First of all, it's embedded into the liberal and the progressive agenda that has flooded the political arena today. This is both institutional and by public outcry. When have you ever heard the idea, as crime rates are escalating, uh, that you're going to defund the police? Less police. Let's not equip them. They've even suggested uh, sending social workers to the site of domestic violence. Yeah, a social worker would have done Paul Pelosi a lot of good. He needed a police officer with a gun and a baton. Now, this whole idea of defunding the police has been pulled back on because of how insane it is in light of the current climate. But the fact that it became part of the liberal agenda in the first place is an outrage. Never before in the history of our country and probably the world has such an appeal been made. You've heard the term no cash bail. What that means is uh, that criminals are arrested, uh, they stand before a judge, uh, and they're simply released. These can be perpetrators of misdemeanors, and in some cases felons, uh, and in some cases guilty, uh, or at least suspected of a violent crime. Uh, they are simply released, no bail. They're simply released on their own recognizance to show up like good little boys and girls when their court date comes. And guess what? They don't show up. And guess what else? They commit further crimes. 
the so-called progressive district attorneys in many of our major cities like New York uh, and San Francisco and Los Angeles. They got so fed up uh, with the recent uh, uh, district attorney in San Francisco uh, and his liberal no bail defund the police policies uh, that they actually impeached him uh, and kicked him out of office, which is they sh what they should do with all of these individuals. Can you show the chart? I forgot to tell you, I sent a picture of a chart. I forgot to mention it to you. Do you have it? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Otherwise, I'm not going to waste time. You don't have it. Okay, well, the picture's there. I emailed it to 1000castron at gmail.com. If you find it, throw it up there. This chart indicates the thousands of New York City police officers that are quitting. There's about a 400 number attrition rate of police officers every year, either through retirement or they find another job or they get about 400. In the year 2016, it began to skyrocket and so far this year, 1,400 police officers uh, have resigned or quit. Uh, they're getting out of New York City. Uh, they're not supported there. They arrest felons uh, and they're back in the streets the next day and they're fed up uh, and they're frustrated uh, and their hands are tied and they can't do their job. And so they're going to other cities and other uh, municipalities to find work elsewhere. And they've lost, I think, in the last two and a half years, uh, 2,500 police officers. I'm moving on, so never mind the chart now. Number two is the increasing crime rates. FBI data shows that crime rose... Uh, this is generally across the board, violent, nonviolent crimes, 30% from 2019 to 2020. The largest single year ever recorded. Jesus said lawlessness is going to abound. The number of homicides increased 4.3% nationally in 2021. That was after a 30% increase the previous year. Compared to 2019 mid-year figures, the cities, larger cities uh, in total have experienced a 50% increase in homicides uh, and roughly 36% increase in aggravated assaults. Lawlessness will abound is what Jesus said. And not all cities are experiencing declines of crime. So far this year, Atlanta has seen a whopping 20% increase in homicides uh, while New Orleans has experienced a 40% spike. Why shoplifting, another article, why shoplifting uh, is now de facto legal in California. Up to $950 of shoplifting is a misdemeanor. Won't be investigated. You can walk in and walk out. Uh, no staff or security personnel will stop you uh, and no police will be called. Uh, and in some cases, uh, they're actually taking what they want to shoplift uh, to get it added up in the, by the cash register. Uh, and if it comes up to seven or 800, they think, oh, I can go get a couple hundred dollars more. And they do it and they walk out. Because of this law, California is extending an open invitation to anyone to walk in and take. Just like that, since they know that police or prosecutors won't bother with a misdemeanor complaint uh, and that store personnel won't make an effort to stop them. So this is a spirit. And this spirit is advancing throughout our culture. Paul Pelosi would have thought lawlessness is something I read about in the newspaper. No, it kicked his door down Friday morning. We were all once lawless, weren't we? The potential for all the above is in all of us because of our sinful nature. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, uh, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. You're living outside the boundaries of God's law. And sin is lawless. So we've all been guilty uh, of lawlessness ourselves. We're all and have been lawbreakers. Lying, deceit. Sexual immorality, fornication, and adultery. Feeding a pornography habit. It's all become the norm today. 
breaking God's law, and people do it today without any conscience whatsoever. It's the norm. Everybody fornicates. Everybody has sex outside of marriage. If you're not happy in your marriage, go ahead and have an affair and commit adultery. And people do it today without any conscience. And that is until the love of Jesus Christ comes our way and brings conviction to our sin that we are lawbreakers, but we need to repent and get our hearts right. And there's a warning against associating with lawless people. Most any one of you could be corrupted if you made friends with a lawless person. That's what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baleo? Uh, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? You better watch out who you run with. I'm not saying leave uh, uh, all associations. I have relationships with people that are not saved, but it's not a friendship relationship to the point where they influence me. The relationship exists for me to witness to them and try to bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians says in the Amplified Translation, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So you've got to watch who you run with and take care you're not running with lawless people. Lawlessness is going to be judged. You may get away with some things here and now. Nobody may catch you. You may never get arrested and put in front of a judge and end up incarcerated. Man, you think I got away with it? No, you're going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords one day, the ultimate judge who will judge all lawlessness. And if you don't allow lawlessness to be judged here on earth, the, the price for it there is going to be incomprehensible. Lawlessness is going to be exposed. Your lawlessness. Uh, you could be sitting here this morning and be lawless. We don't know it, but God does, and it'll be exposed one day. Your lawlessness is going to be exposed, uh, judged uh, when we stand before God. Matthew 7, 23, Jesus said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, uh, living outside the boundaries uh, of either civil law or God's law. You may have gotten away with it. Nobody may around you may be the wiser, but you're a lawless individual uh, and you're going to stand before God and your lawlessness is going to be exposed and judged. A day of reckoning is coming. In Matthew 13, 40, Jesus said, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will, ascend, will send out his angels, uh, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, uh, and those who practice lawlessness, uh, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So you don't get away with anything, actually. Lawlessness is going to be judged, and then you and I need to have a right attitude toward lawlessness. It's not something for you and I to snicker at, to make a joke about, but it's something to take very seriously. In Hebrews 1.8, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. It's not a joke. It's not cute. It's not funny. Lawlessness is going to take people to hell. Lawlessness is going to break up marriages and destroy children and young people and going to violate and injure. You have loved righteousness. Is speaking about Jesus. He has loved righteousness and hated lawlessness for what it's done to his creation. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. So here's the question that I want to head toward secondarily. Let me read the text first. This is Luke 12, verse 35. In light of all that's happening in our world, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, that he may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And, he, and if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch 
and find them. So blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Far too many of us. Let me, let me just get personal here. Far too many of us are living carelessly at the most crucial hour. In the face of this very clear warning, lawlessness will abound. That's a sign that Jesus Christ is coming. The clear warning is necessary because despite the signage that is evident, we all have a tendency to be distracted and to not be paying sufficient attention to what's going on around us actually. That's why we miss so much church. That's why we compromise to the degree that we do. That's why we harbor attitudes in our hearts that are not of God. You're not watching, nor are you ready. Verse 40 in the Amplified Translation says, you too be continually ready. That's what the word ready means, be continually ready. Because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We've got all these signs, all these indicators that are presenting themselves to help warn us to be always watching, always vigilant, always ready, and yet we are a people so easily distracted. People have a hard time focusing, don't they? We have a hard time focusing and paying attention. Just try preaching to you all sometime. Every time someone's head goes down, I know you're texting and you're goofing around on your phone or checking a football score. Getting up and walking out when you don't need to. I know there's sometimes when nature calls or something, or your child is calling and you've got to go. It's not... You know, the adrenaline rush and the dopamine rush we get from pointing and clicking on our computer or scanning videos on TikTok. What, and I have no idea what I just said. I just know that that's what's happening out there. Oh, that, that gives you. But sitting here listening to me preach. I wonder if I can check my phone without moving my head down. You, you try doing this sometime. It's not the easiest thing to hold people's attention anymore, and we don't listen. And I wonder, how many of you are not watching? And because we're not watching, we're not totally ready, as we should be. If this is not something on your mind, that Jesus could come today, this could be our last moments on earth. If that's not on your mind, or it's something you haven't thought about for some time, I suspect you may not be quite ready. There may be some lingering attitudes that you should have repented of and gotten rid of. You're not living for Christ as fervently and adamantly and passionately as you should be. There's, a, there's a, um, an offense now called distracted driving. When you're driving, you've got to pay attention. And there are no excuses. Oh, I, I was looking over here and, and I hit that pedestrian. You're going to jail. You're supposed to be alert, paying attention. You're supposed to make sure everyone in your car has their seatbelt on. You're going 70 miles an hour on a freeway, two feet from someone else who's going 70 miles an hour. And the person in front of you is going 70, and the person behind you is going 75. They're going to try to swerve. You ought to be paying attention. No, you're texting. Driving demands you be alert. You pay attention. And like a lot of people who 
are guilty of distracted driving. There are a lot of Christians who are distracted. Jesus warned again in Luke 21, take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing and drunkenness. And I hope that's not the case here or the cares of this life. That's probably the case. You're so consumed with money and material possessions and what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day, Jesus kind of just gets pushed aside, doesn't he? Church attendance, ministry, uh, that's kind of a secondary thing that I can do if I happen to feel like it or if my busy schedule, I'm so busy, Pastor, you don't understand. The cares of this life have distracted you. And then that day will come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch, therefore, there's that word again, and pray always. Are you doing that? That you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So what he's saying there is this should be something on your mind. But we get so distracted, so diverted, we detach from the church, from ministry, so easily because of the cares of this life. He said, watch and pray always. That's what we should be doing. That should be the highest priority. The Amplified Translation translates that verse this way. Be on guard that your hearts are not weighted down and depressed with the giddiness and the debauchery and the nausea, it uses that word, of self-indulgence and the worldly worries of life. And then that day when the Messiah returns will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Who's listening? Who's paying attention today? Who's alert? Who's watching? And who's ready? It should be you. And that's the warning here. Watch and be ready. You can't be ready if you're not watching. And you won't be watching if you don't take this seriously. This life is to make preparation for what I'm talking about. And it may be that some are woefully prepared who should be better prepared. How foolish are we if we don't take advantage of the opportunity we have to get ready. We've been warned. We have the word of God. We have Pastor Erdy Lopez who's ministering constantly on the need for readiness in light of all that's happening in the world. That's a great gift to all of us. But for a moment, let's take living in the last days, time is short, Jesus is coming. Let's take that off the table for a second. We're all headed for a day of accountability before a holy and a righteous judge. You live another 10, 20, 30, 40 years and then pass away. Then you're going to stand before God. Are you making ready for that? You see, watching and being ready doesn't just have to do with prophetic realities. It should enhance that. But it's life itself. Hebrews 9, 27, and it is appointed for men to die once after this judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin unto salvation. You know, there are times when you have to be alert. Driving on the freeway at 70 miles an hour with traffic all around you is one of those times. You've got to be alert. And that should be the posture of every one of you. Verse 35 of our text. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, uh, they may open to him immediately. Do you know what that means? It means those that are in the house are dressed and they are ready and they are waiting and they are watching and they even see the master walking up the sidewalk. They're ready. They're all set up. And when he not, they open the door immediately. I'm ready. But a lot of Christians uh, are going to have to try to run to the closet and get ready. You've let offense consume your thinking. You're angry with someone over something. And that dominates your thinking. 
You can't be ready while you're diverted like that. You're consumed with the material realities of life and I want people to make a lot of money and and have nice things in homes and be able to bless people financially we need a lot of money to plant churches uh, all over the world we want people to prosper but the Bible gives a warning that it can be a trap where you justify compromise uh, for the sake of making more money money making is not worth uh, compromising your faith of Jesus Christ Blessed, verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, uh, will find watching. You're looking up. You're paying attention to what's going on around you, dealing with life, paying your bills, uh, loving and serving. Uh, and, but you got one eye up. You've got your traveling shoe. You're ready to go. And this is not automatic just because you attend a church like this. I know you have a spiritual dimension to your life. I know that you love Jesus. I know that you're cognizant of your own shortcomings and your own sin. But the reality is, are you watching? If you were watching, I think that lends itself to a higher degree of a willingness to repent for what's wrong with us. If you're watching, I can't tolerate unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. I got to get rid of it. I got to lose it. I got to forgive those who I'm angry with. I got to not allow the material realities and needs of life uh, to circumvent my faith in Jesus Christ. The word means to pay strict attention, to take heed, lest through emission some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. That's the urgency with which we need to be living life. We're watching. Why? Because if we're not watching, something's going to happen that can catch us off guard. And then verse 40, therefore you also be ready. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Well, we're expecting him, kind of, aren't we? That's what... Pastor Ernie preaches the imminence, we believe in the imminent return at any moment of Jesus Christ. But as a Christian, you can be so busy scurrying about, you're feeding an offense, you're chasing money, you've got more of your eyeballs on this life than you do on the one that's coming. And you have to have your eyes and your heart on both, I get that. But it's deficient when it comes to this idea of watching. The Son of Man is coming in an hour, You're, you're not expecting, you're not ready, you're not watching. And that could be any one of us. So how do you be ready? Watch. Live carefully. Pay attention. I think we would deal with a lot more of our attitudes uh, that are not of God if we were living carefully and paying attention and watching. I want to be clean. I want to be dressed. I want to be ready. I want my heart to be right. Before you mouth off to your husband or your wife or somebody else uh, and say something you shouldn't say if you're watching you you don't do things like that that that's a restraining force that produces righteousness secondly live a repentant lifestyle take every opportunity to be as thoroughly right with God as you can be the first one after this sermon is right now at this altar Hebrew says let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. More church as we see Jesus coming. More involvement, more investment in the work of God. And then I think we should all be an instrument of warning for one another and for the lost. Ezekiel was rebuked by God in captivity in Babylon. God had to approach him, speak to him and say, Ezekiel, you're you're a watchman. You're supposed to be warning people of imminent danger that is coming their way. If you warn them and they listen, they will be saved. If they warn them and they don't listen, it won't be on you, but you must warn them. If you don't warn them, their blood will be on your hands. We're living in crucial times, and I think one of the greatest signs 
and the evidences that Jesus is coming soon is that lawlessness is abounding. Nobody can deny that. It's unusual. The increases are like nothing we've ever seen historically before. And Jesus says uh, that this lawlessness uh, is going to appear and start manifesting itself. Uh, and that'll be an indication that I'm coming very soon. Which means we should all be watching and we should all be ready. I want you to bow your heads with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I would like all of you to make a decision right now to be in church tonight for evangelist Glenn Puglisi's sermon on confronting witchcraft. You're going to discover things tonight through his message that you didn't know or didn't think about, things that are bothering you, tormenting you, and you're going to find real freedom and deliverance. And I want to challenge you to bring people that need Jesus. You're going to hear a sermon the likes of which you don't hear very often. Not a lot of preachers or pastors or evangelists preach on this kind of thing. But I know Pastor Glenn's uh, burden and vision is to get people delivered when he goes into a church and preaches. He wants results. He wants people's lives to be different. And he's seeing results with these kinds of messages. So please be here tonight. Prayer at 530, service at 630. As our heads are bowed, nobody moving around for a moment. There are people here, first of all, that are not right with God. You're not right with God. There's no shame in admitting that. A sinner who needs salvation, that's what I was. And without Jesus, I am nothing. Anything good in my life is him in me. Look at your life. Look at what you're creating. Peace, joy, victory, really? Happiness? Most people that we run into live tormented lives. They say that one out of five people either thinks about or tries to commit suicide. People are depressed today. People are horribly tormented and discouraged and guilty and condemned in their minds. And they can't find any peace. Maybe moments. You may take a drug or drink a bottle and feel okay, but... You know that that's not the answer, and it doesn't last, and it makes things worse. But people don't know where to turn. They don't know where to escape to. They don't know where to run. I'm suggesting that you run to Jesus this morning, that you get your heart right with God and quit running from him. Quit justifying your sin. Quit playing religious games, saying, oh, uh, me and Jesus, we're good. No, you're not good. You're a sinner, and you're on your way to hell. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. Repentance was a part of his message. And it's a part of our message here at the Door Christian Fellowship. You can't just receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to first repent of your sin. Acknowledge your sin. I'm not right with God, but I want to get right. I'm sorry for the person that I've become. And I'm sorry that my sin has hurt people. Husbands hurt their wives. Uh, wives hurt their husbands. And we both hurt our children. And we hurt those around us because of our sin and our selfishness. We're angry, we're bitter, we're frustrated. We take it out on the person closest to us and we end up injuring and hurting. God, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for hurting people. I'm sorry for hurting you, Lord, because I know my sin sent you to the cross and I'm sorry for hurting myself. I'm sinning against myself. I'm living outside the boundaries of what's in my own best interests. And now, it's time for you to make a decision. That's what it's time for. It's time for you to make a decision to repent and to get your heart right with God once and for all. No more excuses. No more blame. Yeah, I know you had it rough. Upbringing, background, hurt, betrayed, wounded, violated, all of that. Yeah, okay, I get that, and I'm not unsympathetic toward that. But you can't let that be the excuse can't blame others you're a sinner and whether those things happened or not you're a sinner and you need to repent and receive Christ as your Savior that's what's going to fix you blaming others making excuses doesn't fix you it only exacerbates and makes worse the man or woman you are I'm giving you the answer to life tonight and it's Jesus 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, whosoever is in Christ is a new creation. Doesn't that sound good to you? Whosoever is in Christ is new. Old things pass away, all things become new. That can happen to you right now. If you will allow me to pray for you, if you'll acknowledge your sin and make a determination to receive Jesus, and if that describes you, I want to ask you to do one simple thing right now. Nobody is looking around. Every head is bowed, every eye closed. I want you to lift your hand so that I can see it, and then I'm going to say a prayer for you. Lift your hand right now, please. In Jesus' name, I want to get my heart right with God. I'm not right, but I want to get right. Lift your hand up. Have enough courage, enough humility, enough honesty with yourself about your condition. Don't wait till it's too late when you're standing before God and you haven't done this. It'll be too late then. It's not too late now. Lift your hand right up and put it right back down all over this building. Pastor, I'm ready to repent. I am sorry and I'm ready to receive Jesus. Lift your hand up right now all over this building in the name of Jesus. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you very, very much. Anyone else who joined this one honest heart, pray for me. I want to get my heart right with God in Jesus' name. Lift your hand right up. Lift it high so that I can see it and join this one. Maybe you're backslidden. You once gave your life to Christ, but you're not living for God. I'm not interested in the reasons or excuses or who you're blaming for that. Oh, I went to a bad church. I had a bad pastor. This Christian, I'm not interested. None of that's going to matter on Judgment Day. You've got to be able to process life and maintain a right heart with God. And you're backslidden. And what you need to do is rededicate your life to Christ because as of now, you're not watching, you're not ready, you're not living for Him. Would you lift your hand up right now? Lift it high. Please let me pray for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, my brother, way in the back there, you lifted your hand. Would you look at me? Did you mean that? You meant that, I believe you did. Would you come and let us pray with you right now? Someone's going to come with you. Brother Andre is right behind you, or Enrique is right there. Okay, you come and bring him and pray. There may be others that are here. You really need this altar to cry out to God, and I want to ask you just to get out of your seat. Come and find a place to pray. So how... Does this sermon land with you? Watching and ready? When the master comes and knocks on the door, you're dressed, ready, bathed, cologne, perfumed, everything buttoned up. I am ready because I've been watching for this moment to come. No funky attitudes, no sin per se. I know we're not perfect, but we're doing the best we can to be as surly right with God as we can be. Are you sufficiently watching to rid yourself of every attitude that is not of God in your heart? If you feed an offense, it means you're not watching and you're not ready. I'm not saying you're not saved, but you need to fix that. He's coming back for people that are watching. That's what the scripture tells us. Watching, ready, waiting, anticipating. Taking care of business in life, but not allowing it to be a diversion or a distraction. I don't want to stand before God and have to answer for a half-hearted, compromising life. I think probably we all need an altar. Paul Pelosi would have never expected that the kind of lawlessness that he experienced would have come through his door, but it did. That's the age we're living in. Lawlessness will abound. It's going to reach into the mansions of High Street and it's going to reach into the depths of the ghetto and the neighborhoods of our cities.
Let's all stand. I want to open the altar and ask you to come and find a place to pray. We need to talk to God about the need of our hearts. Let's utilize this altar to get us thoroughly right with God. And maybe some of the greatest and most dramatic changes can take place in our lives and our character as a result of this. God needs to purge us and remove everything from our hearts that is not of him. Every thought, every attitude, every imagination, every habit, every action that doesn't reflect his virtue, his righteousness, and his holiness in Jesus' name. Oh God, we need you so desperately. Flood this altar with your ministering presence. Send fire from heaven. Fire that purges, fire that cleanses, fire that encourages our hearts, oh God, so that we anticipate, look forward to your soon coming. Oh Jesus, we need you more than ever. In the hour in which we live, Lord, I want to be alert, watching, paying attention. Never diverted, never distracted. Oh, ria la ra vi la ra ba ka, ria la ra vi la ra ba sho, ria. Yendere a la ra vi la ra ba ko, rio la ro bo ra ba la ra vi la ra mando ro la ro se. Oh, Lord, you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be glorified. You're worthy to be exalted. Your name is high above every name. We're going to sing quietly, worshiping the Lord. I want you to pray. I want you to press in. Lord, cleanse my heart. I'm ready here at this altar to repent and come clean with everything in my life that is not of you. I know I've harbored attitudes and habits that are not of God, and I need that curse broken in my heart. From this day forward, I'm pursuing righteousness. I'm watching for your soon coming, and I'll be ready. Oh, that's what we need, oh God, created us a clean heart. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Another element to this message isn't there that I didn't touch on. It might require a whole sermon. Lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. Among other things that that might say, that may have a broad societal implication that people read all these horrible things happening as kind of, oh, well. But there are people here, perhaps you've been touched by lawlessness like Paul Pelosi was. Beaten over the head with a hammer. That's going to traumatize him and change him forever. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, perhaps. And there are people here, you've been violated by lawlessness. You were in the hands of a lawless person and they sexually violated you. You were in the hands of a lawless person and they injured you somehow emotionally or physically or spiritually and it affects us the love of many will grow cold because of lawlessness it affects us so I want to close in a prayer and I want you all to stand and I'm not going to ask for anyone like that to identify themselves you know who you are and again I think we've all been affected by law you I mean you read things in the paper anymore and it's like oh well love grows cold we lose our intense hatred for lawlessness. We kind of accept it as just the way things are. So we got to be careful that that doesn't happen to us. And then if lawlessness does kick our back door down and we do get beaten over the head with a hammer, there's deliverance and help for you. You don't have to live with those kinds of scars. I've talked to many people who have been uh, uh, either violated by uh, sexually or by acts of violence and it, it man, it changes you. And you can be delivered from that. And I want you to pray with me. God in heaven, I recognize the age in which we live. The age of lawlessness that Jesus prophesied 
it's so clear to me now that he was talking about what's going on right now, right before our eyes. And Lord, I, help, I ask you to help me be the witness and the testimony that I need to be in order to warn others of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I need deliverance from having been impacted and affected by lawlessness around me. I don't want it to change my heart. I don't want it to change my attitude and my spirit. Lord, I pray for healing, for deliverance of my emotions, my physical body, and my spiritual life. I want to live in victory and dominion, and I break the curse of trauma and traumatic events because of lawlessness right now, and I accept my deliverance. In the name of Jesus, I pray.